Good afternoon, everyone um, who's joining us in California or the West Coast, and good day or evening, depending on wherever else you may be, like Rachel, um, who is joining us from the dead of night. Um, <laughs> we'll just give people some time to file in here um, from the waiting room, and then we'll get started in just a minute with today's talk. Um, this um, webinar is being recorded, and we'll post it um, later on, on the website of the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. So uh, I'll just begin with a land acknowledgement. This event and the UC Irvine campus are within the ancestral and unceded shared territories of the Achaman and Tongva people. The region extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. As members of a land-grant institution, we acknowledge the Achaman and Tongva as the traditional land caretakers whose efforts to steward and protect the land continue today. And thank you all again for joining us. Um, welcome to Money, the Metaverse, and the Magic Circle, a talk with Rachel O'Dwyer. I'm Bill Maurer. If you don't know me, I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at the University of California at Irvine and also the Director of the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion. And Rachel is a lecturer in digital cultures in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. She's the author of the new book, Tokens, The Future of Money in the Age of the Platform, um, published by Verso Books. Uh, Tokens was recently long listed for the Financial Times Schroeder's Book of the Year Award for 2023. Rachel was formerly a research fellow in Connect, the Center for Future Networks and Communications at Trinity College Dublin, and a visiting Fulbright Tech Impact Scholar in collaboration with the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion here at UC Irvine. She's also the curator of the Dublin Art and Technology Association and a regular contributor and co-editor for Neural Magazine of Critical Digital Culture and Media Arts. And Rachel will speak for about 35 or 40 minutes, and then um, we will open the floor for Q&A. Please feel free to um, put any questions or comments in the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will help moderate those um, when we get to that part of the webinar. So Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Um, um, and I'm sorry, it's the dead of night, but we're glad you could be with us regardless. Um, and I'll just hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Bill. And it's not too dead of night, actually. It's only eight o'clock, so it's actually not that bad. And um, yeah, thanks. I I basically twisted your arm anyway into <laughs> giving a talk at UC Irvine because, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's meant so much to me uh, to have feedback the whole way through my research from the IMTFI. So um, it's, you know, it, it, it's really great to to sort of get to share um, my research now and particularly uh, maybe this, you know, little bit of of the book. Um, so what I'm talking about today is is sort of the last chapter of tokens. And in some ways it's it's I think it's probably the the thinnest chapter and the one that has um yeah maybe the least kind of depth in terms of research behind it. Um and that's partly maybe why I wanted to talk about it today, but also I think I was kind of keen to talk about it because I felt like there was some maybe crossover between some of the ideas that I was grappling with um, in relation to uh, online game economies and questions of like fungibility and non-fungibility. And yeah, maybe some of the more recent um, work that I'd read or work I'd read in draft form of bills around NFTs and uh, fungibility and non-fungibility. Um, so yeah, this talk is called Money, um, the Metaverse and the Magic Circle. So this idea of the magic circle um, kept coming up when I was interviewing um, game developers and economists and mathematicians who've been employed in their capacity as economists by um, game development companies to sort of keep the economies of games working smoothly. So I'm um, not a gamer myself, but I'm sort of lucky enough that um, I have five brothers and they all work in the tech industry. And in particular, my older brother, Ross, um, works uh, worked sort of in developing physics engines for many years and works for Oculus and for Meta. So I was able to sort of get access to quite a lot of people in the gaming industry and speak to them while I was writing the book. Um, 
uh, including, I suppose, people who were who were quite involved in, yeah, in this question of kind of in-game economies uh, to get some sort of insight in how they were thinking about it. But I wanted to start, I suppose, by maybe looking at this example that was talked about quite a lot at the very height of the um, NFT bubble, which was Axie Infinity. Um, so during the NFT bubble, there was sort of a new category of games, which was called play to earn. And this was where players would run tasks and were, re were rewarded with uh, native tokens that could be traded for crypto or for fiat currency. And the, one of the best known of these was called Axie Infinity. And the object of the game was to gather these cartoon axolotls or axes, which were represented by NFTs. And so the NFTs were, they were kind of like an amphibian cousin of the crypto kitty. And the axes were cute. I mean, they looked a little bit stoned, I guess, like they'd been playing video games. Um, and I mean, they didn't have any massive utility. They could be bred and and battled within the game. And, you know, by trading and battling or dogfighting, the Axies users could earn a token, which was called a smooth love potion. And those tokens then in turn could be swapped or cashed out for money. Um, pl players could also earn another token called an AXS token that represented uh, a voting stake in the game's future, although those tokens as well could be cashed out. And during the COVID lockdown, players, particularly in the Philippines, turned to gathering axes. Um, and so their play, you know, a bit like um, gold farming, I suppose, at the turn of the 21st century, became a kind of work. Um, and that seems maybe like a convenient place to end the Axie story. But as the game grew popular, the price of the NFT Axies inflated to the point where it cost incoming players as much as $1,500 just to buy into the game. Um, because this was so prohibitively expensive for many, uh, a system emerged whereby existing owners began sort of renting fractional reserves of their assets to other players mm -hmm. so a second tier could work someone else's axes then and take a cut and um, so owners became managers and workers were i guess somewhat euphemistically called scholars managers would recruit recruit scholars on reddit or other message boards set quotas for them and set some kind of a, a profit split like i think usually somewhere between 30 and 50 percent and um, and in February, I think, of 2023, Sky Mavis, who were uh, the company who were behind um, Axie Infinity, also allowed the um, major stakeholders, so AXS holders or managers, to actually borrow against their in-game NFT assets as well. Um, so this was a quote from a Philippine father who was sort of encouraging his children to enter the business, where he was saying... You know, contrary to the idea of holding, you know, college degree in the next 12 years, my kids won't need a college degree. They'll just need to learn how to create value in virtual worlds. Obviously, that idea or that business model was quite short lived and um, a scam or scandal, you know, um, very shortly after that led to kind of 600 million um, value from Axie Infinity actually being kind of stolen from the game. Um, a lot of players withdrew from the world, citing mental health issues from actually playing it. And today the tokens, which were worth, I think, about $150 each, are now worth about six. So a lot of players who invested a lot of money in the Philippines into the game are now actually left in debt. So like a lot of these games, you know, the the kind of economic structure of that was largely just a sort of a Ponzi scheme that was reliant on other players sort of being recruited into the game. So, you know, what what exactly was the value based on within something like Axie Infinity and what were the rails sort of in and out of this sort of in-game economy? Um, long before things like NFTs blurred the lines between real and virtual value, a lot of game communities had thriving economies based on the production and sale of virtual in-game goods, you know, loot and collectibles. So without ever really being that interested in gaming, I remember 
even 2013 or 2014, when I first started encountering um, what I suppose are now called NFTs, having a sense that probably if you look at the um, economies of online games, that's probably where you're going to get a sense of, um, you know, a, a broader history of artificial scarcity within a digital space. So as early as 1987, gamers were informally trading um, cash for improvements to characters in basic multi-user dungeon games or MUDs. And a decade on then, you know, the development of different graphical MMOs and internet resale sites gave rise to this huge shadow economy in virtual tokens. And today, virtual assets are worth more than 100 billion each year. And that's irrespective of changes that have sort of happened around, you know, the devaluation of the metaverse, the devaluation of crypto. Um, the most common purchases are things like skins and cosmetic segments, followed by seasonal and battle passes. Um, but I sort of wanted to think a little bit, I suppose, about how did we get here and maybe how as well, how have the ownership models changed around some of these goods or tokens, maybe from items that are specifically sort of designed to be scarce to items that are based specifically maybe around um, like network effects. But I wanted to start maybe by looking at this artist, actually, Alan Butler, um, whose work deals a lot with um, video games. So Alan Butler, is he's probably best known for this series of works um, down and out in Los Santos. Um, so it's a series of um, works that use the in-game camera from Grand Theft Auto to capture 3D rendered homeless people and desolate landscapes in Grand Theft Auto. Um, so while the, the poor of Los Santos aren't the main point of that game, Butler argues that it's still possible to have sort of real emotional experiences while interacting with them. I think, you know, anyone who's interested in TikTok will have heard a lot about like NPCs or non-playable characters over the summer. But this is, you know, Butler, I suppose, you know, experimenting with um, interacting with non-playable characters in a different way. So he's... Um, yeah, I suppose he's exploring how those characters are aware of his presence as he photographs them. Like sometimes he says they ignore him, sometimes they attack him and he has to defend, to defend himself. Um, he sort of looks at how they talk to each other, how they share alcohol and cigarettes or ask for money to buy drugs, um, how they gather together in different places uh, in the game economy. Um, but he's particularly, you know, as an artist, he's sort of drawn to stuff around the edges of the game, that the game is kind of classing as worthless. And so the images he's producing are these really evocative screen grabs of stuff that's, yeah, the game is sort of classing as worthless and yet actually costs quite a lot in terms of, you know, CPU to actually reproduce. And lately, this work at Replica Simulacrum, um, which is from 2021 on, has been specifically looking at images of digital rubbish in Grand Theft Auto um, and other online games. Um, so he's saying, you know, litter is there to create realism. And like its real world counterpart, we're sort of invited to think of it as like shit and pretend it's not there. Um, so the way Butler's describing it or he's described it to me and in interviews is that you know, each solitary piece of rubbish um, is installed as a file in a game library, um, a database of every element reproduced in the game. And, you know, due to sort of the legacy of, of how games are installed on a user's machine, because it was actually, you know, it was initially it was too computationally expensive to move data across the network. The, these sort of game files and the image files, they're still tend to be um they're installed, you know, as a as a game client on the user's computer or the user's console, um, rather than on a like a server client. Um 
So downloading the game sort of moves this data then through multiple servers and playing the game sees the object loaded into RAM and processed by the CPU and the GPU. And finally, the computer outputs the image via HDMI cable onto a monitor. And the litter, as I want to look at later, isn't just an image file. It's also an object with various different properties, functionalities and interdependencies and relationships with other objects that are surrounding it. So if a player actually tries to interact with the litter, like shooting with a gun so that it breaks up into different pieces, say, or new smaller litter files and sound effects have to be loaded to go alongside that. Um, so if you think that every street, for example, in, in GTA has 100 pieces of litter on it, how many microprocessors does it take to actually render them in each instance? How many files have to be rendered? How many different sorts of functionalities have to be associated with each of these files? Um, and Butler's piece, I suppose, is, is thinking specifically about the actual, you know, environmental or power consumption aspects of that. Um, but, you know, as we'll sort of be looking at later, this also has kind of real implications when it comes to actually the fungibility of these objects um, in a sort of an economy that wants to create kind of exchangeability, you know, between virtual worlds. Um, so traditionally, these virtual worlds were designed in sort of a very centralized or enclosed way. So um, game economists speak about the idea of the, like the magic circle. So the game is very much, you know, its own enclosed world. And this online world tends to live on a centralized server that's hosted and controlled by the developers and players or clients. They access the server maybe from their consoles or their phones or whatever device that they use to play the game in the past. And in the game economy, digital items then are entries in a debate in a database on the server. Uh, so this is, you know, I suppose a simplified version of, of, of what that centralized version looked like in the past. So the data might tell them what kind of an item this is, like a piece of rubbish, chair, an orc or a sword, and also how it behaves or might be reproduced in the game world. Developers can script how items are made or traded or destroyed. And sometimes players also have permission to write data to the server. But um, I found Rafe Coster, who um, is a, you know, has has a kind of history in kind of game development and the economies of games, really, really interesting on these ideas of virtual ownership. Um, and he sort of looks at these ideas and the complexity of these ideas in relation to the metaverse. And he said, you know, in a typical game, users or players, I should say, never owned anything. So you paid for the right to access a server, which happened to keep some records linked to your character ID. Um, and um, yeah, this is something I suppose that came up as well when I was interviewing gamers as well. You know, when you ask them, like, what does it actually mean, you know, to own these things that have sentimental value to you? And they'll sort of say, well, you know, I guess it's it's in my inventory, you know, but they also recognize that the the game owns that and, and can wipe it tomorrow. Um, uh, this is a quote from uh, one of the developers or the early founders of Second Life, where, you know, he pointed out that, um, for example, things were so centralized, you know, in the early days of World of Warcraft, that if you composed a love poem over chat, for example, in World of Warcraft, they owned that. So in every EULA at that time, it was really typical for the company to take ownership of everything that users actually created on the platform. Um, and that there was, you know, various different ways in which virtual goods then were made to be scarce. So some of the goods were limited edition drops, for example, that were released in a fixed amount. Some are tied to specific and, and still are obviously, you know, in Fortnite um, or in games like that. Some are tied to specific locations within the game or the real world. Uh, as with things like Pokemon Go, others are non-transferable or soul bound, you know, that they're tied to a character ID. Um, so, um, you know, so an example of this World of Warcraft, which was launched in 2004, was an open world game where avatars com completed quests or they fight monsters or generally hang out with other players. So the play was very open ended and quests were optional. But World of Warcraft had this really rich economy. So players could earn gold by uh, completing tasks in the game. 
And those included things like foraging for herbs that could be sold to other players or mining rare minerals, crafting things to sell at auction like jewellery or weapons, but also more niche activities like trading unique pets to battle. Um, so virtual loot could be acquired in various ways. Um, items could be earned through play, like by completing a quest or killing a monster, but also just by logging a certain number of hours within a game environment. Uh, sometimes they were acquired through in-game exchanges. Uh, if the game, you know, sometimes the game allows players to actually create items or forge them themselves. Um, and then another mode of acquisition sometimes involves what are known as real money trades. So where players can actually use real money to buy virtual loot. So either in sanctioned trades inside the game environment or in shadow markets elsewhere. So World of Warcraft, for example, example in 2000, like launched its own auctions um, to sort of try and uh, discourage players from engaging in sort of gray market activities where they allowed players to sort of engage in, in buying um, goods through kind of a, in a sanctioned auction house. Um, so Edward Castronova, who was an economist, decided to sort of look at the economy of these, you know, online MMOs in, I suppose, in, I think it was in 2001, and try and compare them. I mean, if you can sort of try and compare them to like real world economies. I think he was doing that by looking at sort of what was the sort of cash out value of the average hourly wage that people were earning in World of Warcraft. So I think the average hourly wage was $3.42, which he was comparing to the top third of developed economies, so ahead of Russia, China, and India at that particular time, um, looking at the sort of performing kind of an economic analysis of the game's functional realm, a place called Norath, detailing their money supply, their exchange rate, based on data from black market exchanges that were taking place on the internet, uh, based on their export market. Again, that was based on secondary markets, which I'll I'll look at now in a sec, uh, based on their kind of GNP per capita, their rate of inflation. And um, he was looking at the kind of Azeranthian gold coins then that were produced in World of Warcraft and seeing how they traded at a rate that was comparable to the Russian ruble. Um, so... As I was saying, a lot of these online games spawned um, grey markets that were dedicated to the sale of things that weren't, they weren't really things. Um, so echoing the kind of labour arbitrage at work in Axie Infinity, where workers in the Philippines are, are kind of producing, you know, axes and trading them. Um, players were, I suppose, sinking hours into the game. So aff affluent players could kind of skip the grind, I guess, of foraging or crafting or fighting and level up with real money alone. Um, so many many citizens actually, you know, in, around, I think, 1997, when apparently like a, a currency crisis, I think in Asia, saw a lot of citizens lose their jobs. At, at least that's what I've heard, is that a lot of citizens lost their jobs. And around the same time, Asian governments apparently invested in broadband to stimulate economic development. And so, you know, there's been countless kind of articles, I suppose, written about gold farming. And I don't know how exaggerated some of them are, you know, because you read Guardian articles, you know, where they're sort of talking about prisoners being forced to um, mine World of Warcraft tokens, you know, um, a threat of kind of violence from, from prison wardens. But I suppose maybe one of the more well, you know, documented examples of RMT trading is IGE, which actually took place in Tijuana and was heavily invested in by Steve Bannon, who was, you know, he's former chief strategist for the Trump administration. And I was looking for, I suppose, documentation of IGE online. Um, and actually, I just went to the Wayback Machine there during the week to, to, to pull up some of that. So there's still quite a lot of documentation there, you know, showing kind of what their 
what their yeah different sorts of payment systems they took what kinds of trading systems they had etc and so yeah even though i suppose their business practices explicitly violated you know the end user license agreements of most online games uh lots of labor laws besides um in the early noughties the company was valued i think at 880 million um and um was running as far as it was running out of um had offices in Tijuana and they were selling um yeah basically selling these kinds of online gray market uh, tokens and skins and virtual goods on um retail sites like eBay until um it was kind of Sony and and other companies kind of forced it to be shut down several years later. Um, but yeah, you know, through way back and things like that, there's still a, a fair amount of of documentation um around. But um Steve Bannon and also um the Mighty Ducks young actor who was involved in Tether, uh, Brock Pierce, was also heavily involved in IGE. So they were very actually quite large um gold farming company who were involved in this sort of real money trading so this kind of attempt to formalize the gray markets around these virtual goods so alongside these um gray markets which you know continue today obviously there's um you know more some some are more less more more legal than others i mean csgo for example have kind of open uh, trading in skins and even various different forms of um kind of like lending sites around skins for CSGO on the internet. There's also various problems with um practices like duping where players, you know, as long as games have been around, have found ways to exploit artificial scarcity in games and environments. So, you know, because every act of, of requesting any of these digital objects tends to produce multiple copies. Gamers find ways of exploiting bugs in the game interface to make virtual copies of in-game commodities that are supposed to be scarce. Um, another common practice then alongside duping is called AFKing for away from keyboard, which sees players exploit hacks to log false play hours so uh will you know who's a young gamer who i spoke to quite a lot um for the final chapter of my book um who you know he's he was really interesting to talk to i suppose about the kind of motivations for um the kind of prestige motivations i guess for why players are particularly interested in, in acquiring goods that are ostensibly uh supposed to be worthless was also sort of talking about this idea of, of AFKing. So he said, you know, like this one time you could get like 500 bucks for walking around a square in Animal Crossing. So players were just leaving their characters looping all night long. And in the morning they'd wake up and have so much loot. Um, so in response to things like IGE, companies like Sony changed their EULA then to ban gold farming and successfully petitioned eBay to take down resale auctions. They established then their own formalized auction houses uh, like Station Exchange instead, uh, where, you know, they were taking a cut of the sale price on all of those secondary uh, trades. But, you know, gray market sales still continue to flourish elsewhere. Um, so for corporations that host these virtual worlds, these sort of secondary market trades are... You know, they they disrupt the magic circle because they're 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 sort of revenue streams that leak from the game economy into other spaces on the internet. But for players, they're they're also seen as you know they're often seen as cheating. So gamers will sometimes call these kinds of RMT trades like pay to win. So you know they gesture to the idea that by handing over money, a player can advance within the game without actually grinding or, or questing or doing what they're supposed to do to earn status and um, so players who are who are working in these virtual worlds instead of playing in them are, are sort of ruining ruining the game or ruining the fun for everybody else and um, so uh, Luke Bartlett for example who's the VP of EA Games he was talking to me about how tokens within these games then need balance 
And it really, you know, reminded me of um, like uh, Viviana Zelitzer, I suppose, speaking about how different sorts of tokens as well are, you know, colored for different social contexts. So within a particular game environment like World of Warcraft, that you actually have multiple tokens. So some of the tokens are purely uh, cosmetic. Um, some of the tokens can be, yeah. Um, so the game has to feel fair, basically, where fair kind of doesn't necessarily mean equal distribution, but means equal opportunity. So some of these tokens can be used to buy like access, but others can only be earned through like gameplay. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to try again. Um, I mean, some of the tokens can, you can buy certain tokens, but the tokens you can buy tend not to be able to give you any advantage in the game. They, te they, they're, they tend to only be cosmetic, if that makes sense. They tend to only, uh, they're not supposed to give you any kind of in-game advantage because that would be seen as being somehow unfair or would be seen to actually disrupt the logics of the game. So ostensibly the kinds of tokens that you can actually buy within the game tend to be ones that are supposed to have no real utility. So they're supposed to be only for cosmetic items within the game versus the tokens that you earn through the sweat of your play, as Luke Barthel was saying, are ones that actually allow you to advance within the game. And then RMT trading kind of disrupts that versus uh, drag and kill points, which, you know, numerous scholars have written quite a lot about, which is a, a third kind of reputational currency where uh, in some of these games, groups and guilds have to work together to acquire loot and then they have to figure out how to actually share it. Um, so players might have offered to pay each other in gold for, you know, the right to actually take the loot. But, you know, as Castronova, who's an economist who's looked a lot at these in-game currencies, they didn't. So instead of like paying for the share they've actually developed this reputational currency which is sometimes called dragon kill points or you know sometimes people will just talk about oh yeah there's this reputational currency in this particular game so then they can be redeemed afterwards for a share of the loot a bit like things like time dollars or or like uh, local exchange trading systems so they're tokens that are designed to somehow foster social cohesion within the game. And they can be spent on shared loot or they can actually be kept and used to sort of flaunt your status in the game to sort of signal that you are uh, your kind of OG within that game. Um, so I I got to speak to a mathematician and economist, uh, Sarah Flannery, uh, who's... Um, main job is to sort of create status within these stasis within these virtual worlds so um she has kind of a, a weird claim to fame in ireland so when i was a teenager she won this big uh kind of young scientists award so every year in ireland there is a, a young scientist competition and um she developed um this weird uh kind of alternative to the RSA algorithm when I was about 12 and she was 16 and like made kind of international news. And I think Microsoft, you know, patented it. And um, yeah, it was sort of presented as being kind of an alternative to the RSA algorithm. Uh, but she subsequently went on to work for Sims as an adult and um, developed their in-game economies and um, now works through EA games uh, doing similar things. So her job is to sort of think about this sort of keeping stasis within these games and keeping balance in terms of how do you um, produce maybe drains or sinks within these sorts of online economies. And um, for example, during uh, the pandemic, because of numerous issues with players, you know, duplicating, like illegally duplicating um, goods within Roblox or children, basically, um, Roblox Island produced an economy wipe where they cleared out a lot of duped items and coins that had been inflating market prices. So they just got rid of a lot of items overnight, you know, but as sort of Sarah was saying, 
like the bottom line with a lot of these things, obviously, is that preventing duplication is extremely difficult because bits are bits and you can copy bits. And it's very difficult to actually place any kind of limitation on that. Um, so the kind of classical model for gaming was to try and produce some kind of artificial scarcity around these digital objects. Um, but obviously, you know, you're constantly, I suppose, battling with the idea that information wants to be free and that every time you uh, you circulate a digital object, you're producing multiple copies of that. Um, and, you know, as I suppose digital worlds progressed, some of these ideas started to be challenged. Um, I'm going to, I'm just conscious of time, actually, that I'm kind of over half an hour. So I'm going to skip over one or two slides. So I suppose long before Decentraland, obviously, you know, we had um, Second Life or Linden, um, which obviously is quite interesting, you know, because they were, again, you know, before crypto, um, before, yeah, before any of these experiments with uh, digital kinds of money, obviously Second Life were exploring um, things like issuing Linden dollars and, um, yeah, exploring kind of different kinds of gambling tokens, even, you know, um, jumping through similar hoops that PayPal had jumped through, you know, they, they uh, applied for, their own financial license even um in um 2007 um and inquired the necessary license to actually be a payments processor um but they also i suppose sought um advice from Lawrence Lessig about sort of what kinds of um rights that they would give users over digital objects. So previously, players might have had right privileges over objects, but they had no IP rights to what they actually created. So, you know, back to that World of Warcraft quote where, you know, if you wrote a poem in the chat, World of Warcraft actually owned that. Um, and um, in contrast, Linden was one of the first virtual worlds to actually give IP to creators. So they're exploring this idea of, of a creator economy instead. Um, and um, I suppose it was the first time that a game-like environment had decided to sort of think about itself then as a creativity product. Um, but had similar issues to the other sorts of games in that um, they had developed a, a piece of software called Copybot, which sort of allowed users to create their own digital items and sell them for Linden uh, dollars. And it was kind of like a proto-smart contract. So creators could attach scripts to their objects that specified the terms of sales. And clip, clicking an item um, might copy it and initiate a transfer to the original creator, for example. Um, but because users retained IP in what they'd made, they could, you know, they could technically issue a DMCA takedown against someone who had copied their products, for example. Um, but a lot of people didn't um didn't actually, you know, bother do that. But in 2006, some of the code for actually scripting the objects was accidentally leaked. So hackers made a project, made a program to feed the code back into the world and and basically duplicate multiple objects and that was called copybot and it was you know it's described as i guess second life's napster moment um and whether that was you know really really significant in terms of changing um or um disrupting the economy of, of second life is debatable uh cory andreka would say that in some ways Second Life was never, you know, really about producing this sort of artificial scarcity around these objects because, um, you know, uniqueness was was less useful to them than than sort of brand value or awareness or or getting things out in the world, and in some ways, you know, this is quite similar to the argument that's sometimes made about things like NFTs, where maybe when you have sort of one model that's based based on this idea of um trying to produce some kind of artificial scarcity around objects um 
there was another that was based more maybe around the kind of the network effects of these objects. I was thinking, for example, yeah, similar issues emerged with NFTs. Like, was the value proposition of digital objects based on exclusion or was it based on network effects? So Tim Berners-Lee, for example, auctioned um, off um, uh, an NFT of some of the source code for the World Wide Web uh, in the summer of 2021. Um and, you know, it wasn't clear, I suppose, at the beginning of, like, the internet as we know it, that Berners-Lee's image of hypertext would be the dominant one. So Tim Berners-Lee's World Wide Web used hyperlinks, but the links moved in one direction. So you could follow links forward, but you couldn't follow them back to the source. Another proposal was Project Xanadu, and Xanadu's links were two-way. So you could follow the link forward, but you could also follow it back to the initial source. And um, in Ted Nelson's image, or in Ted Nelson's sort of imaginary uh, in Xanadu, uh, this one over here, um, instead of making it free to link to and reproduce information, the Xanadu project sort of imagined a situation where all information would be free to use, but it would also be proprietary. So you'd have to pay every time you wanted to link to someone else's information. So these payments were going to be denominated in units called NIBs. And... Tim Berners-Lee, like a lot of people, thought that Xanadu, thought that Ted Nelson's um, idea was going to be way too clunky and, you know, that it was basically unusable because, you know, information wants to be free and it would just produce way too many barriers to actually using information and getting it out there. So when Tim Berners-Lee um, was auctioning an NFT of the source code for the World Wide Web, you know, a lot of people criticized him for basically selling out on the entire ethos of the World Wide Web. It seemed so at odds with the open source principles of, of the open web. Uh, and he was criticized for turning his back on that. But, you know, he argued or Tim Berners-Lee kind of shot back that actually, you know, it was totally in line with the initial ethos. And I think in some ways he's, he's right. You know, he, he, by selling an NFT, he wasn't actually restricting what people could do with the underlying code or trying to restrict access. He was just saying, hey, you know, actually, this particular um, this particular thing is special, but I'm not actually restricting access in any way. And similarly, you know, as many people discovered with with a lot of these sort of NFTs or digital goods, there was a distinction between code and content. Um, so people didn't usually own the image or the 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 underlying asset they only owned the token um except in 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 sort of very very rare cases um a little bit like what andreka observed in second life was that this didn't really matter so instead of scarcity what you saw might be an economy of network effects uh what grows the brand is, is actually good for the brand similar to this quote from yuga labs you know the 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 board ape phenomena from 2021, where they were saying, you know, they weren't trying to restrict actually what anybody was doing with those images. So they're saying anything people create with the apes thus far, I think that was like a craft beer, skateboard line, a cartoon, etc., only grows the brand. So they weren't actually concerned with things like artificial scarcity or trying to limit copying. They were just looking at actually building hype um, or network effects around a good um. I am going to skip over a big chunk and just jump down to my last bit here. So the last thing I just wanted to talk about very briefly, I guess, was this idea of sort of fungibility within uh, the metaverse and just leave it there. Um, so obviously, you know, the sort of vision of the metaverse was that like right now what we still have is kind of very... Uh, each platform, we have very sort of siloed virtual worlds. You know, you have your kind of world of Warcraft, you have your Decentraland, you have your Horizon worlds, you have your Roblox. And um, a bit like the sort of vision of the super app, I guess each platform maybe wants to to be the, the magic circle where as Mitch Zamara, who's one of the metaverse game designers, um, says, you know, 
everybody's sort of competing to potentially be the central bank or be be sort of the be the overarching um federal reserve or central bank for for the others who kind of decides how these spaces are going to take shape or regulate like who's going to be almost the rail for a, a broader ecosystem that allows for some kind of um standards i guess for your know, platforms are competing to see who's going to build the world or develop the standards for how items are rendered uh for who will manage identity and maybe most crucially who's going to act as a payment rail for processing like the potential of the purchase or transfer of digital items and i think to that end actually some people with a vested interest in crypto thought that blockchain might be a solution and um, so suppose to like a private rail a blockchain might be used to create a payment rail that would work across different worlds and um, be used to tokenize or maintain a degree of of kind of persistence for digital items or a permanent registry where in-game items could be recorded or transferred and where non-fungible tokens would allow for fungibility you know between these worlds but the problem is right now is 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 this question of you know what what developers call the rendering pipeline which is that there's there's so many different islands and tokens and so many different ways of rendering virtual things and they're all incredibly different so it's not just a question of developing agreements and accounting systems between different spaces it's a question of the rendering pipeline where a sword that's forged in zelda is coded completely differently from a sword in fortnite so both virtual worlds are faithfully rendered, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be faithful to each other. So I think Rafe Coster is has a kind of free to read online blog, which I just thought was really, really fascinating on this. And he goes into a lot of detail. Um, there's like 10 years of 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 writing his up online about this um, on the kind of complexities of these virtual worlds that really sort of helped me understand a lot about this. And, you know, um, so some of this is taken from there where he's sort of speaking about, I guess, where, you know, if you think of the Internet, if you were, you know, pulling up a, a JPEG, for example, um, and that object is stored on a server, then there's, you know, very much a, an agreed upon standard that your computer understands when it comes to loading that specific format. Uh, but the world of on game games is much, much more complicated. So instead of a, a client here, server there kind of model, often the player has a game client and the art comes with it, exactly as you know we saw with that Alan Butler piece that I began with. Um, so that sort of dream of taking your your sword from Zelda from one world into another, you know, what format is that sword? What format is your avatar? It's not just that they look different. They don't even agree on what a sword is. So like talk about non-fungibility. So in the world of games, there are no technical standards. There's just hundreds of different iterations for how you might render a sword or a cube. So um, companies like XM XMDL or X3D are trying to build some of these standards, but they're still years and years away. And it gets even more complicated as you move away from the question of images to objects. So objects don't just have an appearance, but they also have specific functionality. Um, so you might have a template um, for like, um, say, an orc, but then, yeah, say, say you have like a, a fungible orc, for example, but then you have your, your specific or your, or your non-fungible orc, for example, whose name is Fred and Fred has a, fe a flesh wound um, and you give Fred, you know, very specific characters that require, you know, read or write data. And all of this has to be written to a specific uh, server, for example. And then even within that, you know, what types of objects are these? Are specific types like weapons, containers, foods, for example. And these scripts might be dependent on others. Like my apple being eaten, for example, might be dependent on like the fullness of my orc. Um, I think I had a really uh, complicated kind of point here where I was sort of comparing this to um, questions about sort of um, kind of fungibility. Um, and I don't know whether this is helpful at all or not. Um, it probably isn't at all. Uh, 
I had a point I took out of my book, I think, because it was it was too complicated. But I feel like there was there was like, I don't know, something something kind of. um, um, Yeah, I don't know. So uh, something interesting here where, you know, we're trying to create some kind of a a liquidity, I guess, between between these worlds. And yes, you know, there is there's there's an extreme, I suppose, non fungibility right now in between uh between the different sorts of vulture worlds that's 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 uh like impossible to sort of get past um and maybe i'll just leave it there for now i i sort of left out a point completely where i was sort of speaking about you know i'm kind of really interested in sort of what drives people to acquire goods within these worlds like the sort of prestige or the bragging rights uh, that actually make things that are have no ostensible value kind of valuable to people. But uh, maybe we can talk about that in the question and answers. And uh, I'll just leave it there because I've talked for way too long. Yeah, sorry. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so much interesting material and such fantastic research going into the what feels now like the ancient prehistory of some of these spaces um, and really reflecting on what they mean for all of the attention that's being put to Web3 and um, ideas about non-fungibility. Let me let me just pull out a couple um, questions from folks who were here. Um, first, um, Dave Birch, author of numerous books that we know on digital money, um, is disappointed that your book is probably going to be better than his. And so he just went and bought it. Um, so there's that comment in there. Um, <laughs> and Dave also says that fung fungibility is his favorite topic. But he did have a, a question um, about um, whether or not in the research for the book you talked to um, people thinking about money and payments and transactions um, from financial institutions. Um, so in, in the book, is most of the material coming out of these interactions and discussions of games and gamers, or was there some stuff on um, talking to payments professionals? And I know you've done that kind of research in the past, but uh, but that was, that was one. Um, yeah. Go, go ahead. Yep. Uh, oh, for this specific chapter, does they mean, or for, for the book, as a book whole. in general? Well, for the book as a whole, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, for this chapter, this chapter is specifically kind of specifically looked at two, I suppose, subsets. And that was it was either people who were really um, embedded in um, collecting digital items. So often quite young people mm. who were invested in collecting digital items or uh, preppers, super rich preppers who were also very wealthy game developers um, who were involved in building virtual worlds. But yeah, I was trying to think, um, who did I speak to who was involved in financial institutions? Probably, yeah, when I was looking at... Um, uh, I, I spoke to somebody who's involved in digital policy and I yeah, I almost feel like I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention their name, but they were involved. They worked for Amazon at one point and then moved from Amazon subsequently, have worked at various points for Amazon and also for digital policy for the EU and for Ireland. And I'm sure even saying that David probably even knows who I'm speaking about, but um are very involved with like developing kind of policy for the CBDC in the EU mm. and also have worked uh, for payments on Amazon. Don't know if David yeah, men men mentioning they know David because I said I, <laughs> I said to them, oh you should talk to David. And they were like, oh I know I know them very well. So <laughs> men mentioning know. central bank digital currencies is interesting, right? Because it's a very similar kind of problem where everybody wants to create their own Every every central bank experimenting with a central bank digital currency wants to create their own kind of closed world that will then that, ev that everyone else will be able to use, but they'll still own, yeah. the top, so to speak. Um, so Peter Chow White says, really interesting research, Rachel. Thank you for showing us all the connections between early 2000s gaming and metaverse gaming. And then asks, do you see earn to play as similar to gold farming or is there something critically different emerging? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess gold farming, like, yeah, play to earn and gold farming. Yeah, yeah, I would see them as being quite similar. But um, play to earn and gold farming. Yeah, yeah, I guess I would see them as being quite similar in that they both uh, play with the sort of that kind of weird like labor arbitrage, I guess, between um, different sorts of economies where you, you know, where you have different sorts of labor economies. Um, often you have also like gray markets. Um, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. I would. Yeah, yeah, I would see like gold, gold farming, like the sort of gold farming in 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 China, like after the the currency crisis in Asia and the sort of Philippines, um, play to earn gaming as being quite similar, except I suppose that like um. The Axie Infinity one was it was sort of like a, a kind of like like maybe in some ways it's it's sort of more exploitative because it was almost like a Ponzi scheme where it was like asking people to also invest like their own money. Do you know what I mean? Whereas mm -hmm. gold farming, it was at least, you know, you were you were um yeah, people were were sort of working working for somebody else, whereas a lot of people are actually like in debt for mm -hmm. investing in it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, with with gold farming, you were exploited just by another person, whereas with yeah, turn to play, you're exploited doubly exploited yeah. also by the imperative to quote unquote invest and go yeah, to yeah, maybe. Um, although yeah although there were those tiers like because you did have that sort of manager scholar tier as well in in play to earn in X axi infinity like the manager scholar thing where when people were like late investors as well then that they they also ended up working for other people you know like to to you know they couldn't afford to sort of buy in so they they worked as like day laborers on other people's uh Axie assets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. I wonder, um, just so we only have a couple of minutes left, um, I wonder if you'll tell us a little bit about what's next for you. You know, this book has now come out. What are you working on right now? What's the next project? I'm really, really interested in like um kind of um tradwives and um i'm kind of very interested in sorry i'm kind of a bit blank um financial nihilism i guess i'm kind of interested in like the end of like the you know the the sort of end of the good life um in ireland and in america i guess so the fact that you know there's sort of maybe you know when there's no like clear pathway to financial security how on the one hand i suppose that you had men you know yoloing their rent money into things like crypto and retail trading but then i guess over the summer as well i got quite interested in sort of what the feminized equivalent of that was whether that was things like uh, girls asking their boyfriends for money on TikTok to see their reactions or like the stay-at-home girlfriend trend where you have sort of women, you know, looking at, uh, um, yeah, I suppose sort of romanticizing the, the sort of return to the like um, sort of traditional gender roles, like the, the sort of 1950s trad wife, stay-at-home girlfriend um, or the... Um, yeah, these sorts of these sorts of roles of financial dependence, which are at the same time though, really sort of framed in very kind of economic terms. So, like if you look at like tradwives, they sort of extol this very much like return to financial dependence. It's almost like the Viviana Zelitz are like, let's all go back to like pin money kind of thing, you mm -hmm. know, asking our husbands for like invisible dollars. And yet, when you read the Red Pill Women forums, uh, they think about their their own sort of market value in a very kind of economic way. So they talk about like, they have all these weird acronyms like sexual market value, relationship market value, post-war status. It's like, it's like that um, Julia Roberts meme, you know, with the, with the mathematics, like it gets incredibly complicated, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of really, really, really fascinated with um, some of that work now and the kind of role of like social media, within that um, and I have a weird sub stack called living currency where I'm trying to think about some of that 
stuff. And yeah, I guess it comes off um, the first chapter of my book. I was looking at um, Twitch streamers, I guess, and how they were using like Amazon wish lists, I suppose, as the space to um, get paid for their their sort of work online. And, you know, how, how I suppose viewers prefer to gift them um through things like Amazon wish lists, obviously. You know, it's very, very close to Zelitzer's work on on the roles of of, of gifting in, in these spaces. But you know, how 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 have new platforms like TikTok, I suppose, mm. um transform these. But yeah, fantastic. Capacity. Well, we will look forward to that at a next talk. So yeah. um Thank you so much for, I know I didn't get to all of the questions, but I have saved them all, um, which I'll share with Rachel so that she can email you or respond or maybe write about it in a future piece that will come out. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for sharing the book with us. Um, thank you for everyone who attended. Thanks for the questions. Thank you, Jenny, for running the Zoom um, for us. And stay tuned for more such events, but both virtual and in person here at UCI. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks a million. Bye. Thank you.